Welcome to the Churchill College Annual Distinguished Lecture in Computer Science. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today, um, Chris Mayers. Um, in fact, Chris Mayers has just been in a ceremony in the Cockcroft Room where we, we have inducted him as an honorary fellow of the college. Um, so it's a double tops for Chris today. And um, Chris came to us in 1979, I believe it was, and um, he, he did maths and physics and then computer science and got a first in computer science, which was remarkable because he's been blind since the age of 18. And he was the first of a number of blind people who've done the computer science tripost and blazed a path for the others. Um, after that, he went and worked for IBM uh, for a couple of years and then he set up his own company, Data Innovation, um, um, which um, went from strength to strength. And I recall when I was a young lecturer in the 90s, Data Innovation would always volunteer um, speakers if we wanted an industry speaker for our software engineering course to tell us what life was like in the, in the trenches at the front end. Um, Chris um, is now a uh, venture capitalist with investments in about 50 different companies and a philanthropist and a campaigner for disability rights. And um, it gives me enormous pleasure to invite him to give our distinguished lecture for 2018. Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Um, good evening. So every time I visit Churchill, always reminds me um, of myself as a fresh-faced undergraduate and a rather unconfident young man. Um, in those days, although, as Ross said, I was registered blind, I did actually have much more sight than I have now and I desperately wanted to be seen as normal. So I never used to carry one of these, and I never told people about my sight loss until it was absolutely necessary, which sometimes led to some interesting challenges. I recall one particular occasion when I was interviewing for a, for a place at a different university, and the interview was centered around a buffet uh, lunch. Not a great thing when you can't see what's on the table. But I did manage to pull myself together a plate with some cold meat, some bread and a handful of peanuts, and then engaged one of the lecturers in conversation. Um, as he got into um, the subject of his research, I took the opportunity to take a handful of peanuts and put them into my mouth, only to discover that I had not, in fact, picked up some peanuts. I'd picked up the contents of an ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the etiquette question. What do you do at the point like this? Do you try and discreetly disgorge these, um, these cigarette butts, or do you chomp down and hope nobody's noticed? <laughs> so I took the latter approach and was somewhat surprised to find that I did indeed get offered a place at that university. Um, but fortunately, Churchill came to the rescue, so I never had to understand what life is like at an establishment where eating butt ends for lunch is regarded as socially acceptable. <laughs> Uh, I was really pleased to see that last year's lecture was given by my friend um, Simon Peyton Jones. Um, I, I met Simon not through his interests in, in Haskell, but through his um, passion for improving computing education in schools, um, which is a subject also very close to my own heart. I was chairman of Code Club um, for several years, and I'm now on the board of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, in Simon's lecture, him, he, he observes that um, he spent much time in the computer lab as an undergrad with another student called John Hughes, um, who was such a good mathematician that he made Simon realize that he wasn't cut out for that career and should switch to engineering and ultimately to a career in computing. Bizarrely, John Hughes happened to be my supervision partner when I was an undergraduate, and he had exactly the same effect on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> After uh, John had unwittingly convinced me that um, as far as mathematics was concerned, I was in fact a complete dullard, um, I chose to switch, like Simon, uh, to a career in computing. And this is um, a switch that I have never regretted. Um, uh, if I had stayed in mathematics, I would probably have ended up as, a, as an accountant or an actuary or a government statistician. All great jobs, I'm sure. But they wouldn't have exposed me to the extraordinary journey um, that the technology industry has taken for the last 40 years. At this stage, um, it's worth talking about um, my first job uh, at IBM. In fact, I worked for IBM just before I came uh, to Churchill. And this was in 1976. Um, my manager at the time, very good engineer, very thoughtful guy, 
took me on one side after a couple of months and said, you know, Chris, um, it's a real shame that you didn't join the computer industry 10 years ago. Because if you had, you might actually have um, made something of it. He said, but the thing is, for an ambitious young man like you, it's probably not the right industry to be in because basically in computing, everything interesting has already been done. <laughs> um, uh, it's, in, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, the golden era that he was referring back to, which was 1965, at that time, I think there were 20,000 computers in the world. Today, Raspberry Pi produced 20,000 computers, and tomorrow they will produce another 20,000. And each of those computers costs less than 35 pounds each. Um, but nonetheless, um, it has taken a long time for AI to reach anything close to its full potential um, over that period. It was 20 years since that conversation with Colin before um, IBM's Deep Blue, Deep Blue Computer famously beat Gary Kasparov, um, the then world chess champion, one of the landmark moments in artificial intelligence. And it was another 20 years after that before AlphaGo beat the reigning World Go champion. But it was only one year after that until AlphaZero taught itself from scratch to comprehensively beat AlphaGo without being trained on any human strategies. And even more astonishingly, within 24 hours, AlphaZero, the very same AlphaZero program, taught itself to beat the reigning world chess computer champion, Stockfish. Um, now, apologies to the um, statisticians in the room for my entirely unscientific approach here, but it does feel to me as though maybe we are approaching some sort of inflection point on the long journey towards the, uh, the holy grail of artificial general intelligence. That technological singularity, which some futurologists, such as Ray Kurzweil, believe will happen sometime in the second half of this century. Now, as to paraphrase Geoffrey Hinton, um, the, world, the history of the world is not littered with less intelligent beings controlling more intelligent beings. So at that singularity, things could get pretty messy. Now, much as it's very interesting to speculate on that um, singularity, that's not the purpose of this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to look at the rather more prosaic topic of narrow AI and its incremental progress from now for the next 15 to 20 years, which incidentally, I think, could also get pretty messy. Um, it's not going to get messy in any sort of existentialist, grey goo sort of scenario, but it could get pretty messy because of the impact of artificial uh, intelligence on the job market, on the distribution of wealth, on economic rents and on the means of production, which I think could lead to civil unrest writ very, very large and potentially even to global warfare. Okay, spoiler alert, guys. This is not a technical lecture. If anyone came here expecting to hear some deep insights into the use of LTSMs for transfer learning, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. And if anyone came here hoping to see some novel algorithms for implementation of AI on quantum computers, I suggest you get your coat. Ah, I hear no rustling. So I guess everybody is willing to listen to a layman's perspective on possible trends of narrow AI, or at least you're all far too polite to demur. So thank you. Um, after I was with IBM, as Ross said, um, I co-founded a communications business, which later became known as MetaSwitch Networks. Um, that business recruited many undergraduates from Cambridge and, in particular, from Churchill. And we now have about 800 people in that organization spread around the world in various offices, including one here in Cambridge. But in 2012, I stepped back from that and since then have spent most of my time working with an organization called Entrepreneur First. And the mission of Entrepreneur First is to allow brilliant uh, academic technical minds and also brilliant technical minds who are buried in industry to actually move out from those roles and actually explore entrepreneurship as a career. Um, we have uh, uh, programs running in London, in Singapore, in Berlin, and 
um, just about to start a, a program in Hong Kong. And across those programs, we will take several hundred aspiring entrepreneurs um, into the cohort each year. And during 2018, we expect to produce something approaching 100 investable deep tech businesses. And the vast majority of those businesses will somewhere in their technology be using artificial intelligence. Um, almost to the extent that I think mentioning artificial intelligence as a differentiator is pointless. Um, it's just like other technology. And in fact, if a business said to me that they were using AI and that was their right to win, then it would feel to me like somebody 10 years ago saying, yes, our business is based on software running on computers. <laughs> um, so one great um, example of the entrepreneur model um, one of the great successes coming out of, entrepreneur, out of Entrepreneur First so far has been a company called Magic Pony Technology. Um, I was lucky to be the chairman of Magic Pony, and I worked with the founders of that business from day one when they first conceived that they could use artificial intelligence to improve the quality of video on mobile devices in real time. And based on a, 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 a pretty impressive demo, which wasn't entirely smoke and mirrors, they managed to raise about a million pounds of funding and then build a team of around a dozen uh, world-class academics and also absolutely brilliant implementation engineers to take novel algorithms that they were developing um, at, the, at the edge of um, academic research and then implement those um, in low-level, very high-performance code on relatively low-powered mobile devices um, to create a compelling user experience to the extent that after 18 months they were acquired uh, by Twitter for a reported $150 million. Uh, but that was um, quite unusual in that the, I mean it was unusual in many ways, but it was unusual in that the, the impact of their artificial intelligence is pretty much job neutral. Prior to Magic Pony, there were no great teams of graphic designers retouching um, streaming esports video. Mm -hmm. Simply, the economics would not work. Uh, but if we assume that watching video is mostly harmless and actually, and sometimes, is, is quite useful, then why not make the experience as good as possible by using artificial intelligence? Um, the remainder of this lecture, um, I'm going to focus on other um, AI based businesses where the impact on the job market is more significant. Um, many of those businesses are drawn from my own uh, experiences at Entrepreneur First. Now, this impact of AI on the job market is something that has been written about massively over the last four or five years. It's been written about by academics much better qualified than me. It's been written about by bloggers much more articulate than me and it's been written about by management consultants much better paid than me. Um, so I'm not going to espouse any particularly novel economic theories here, um, and I'm not going to promote a, spe a speciously accurate set of statistics based on some arbitrary timeline. But what I do hope to do is by uh, tease, out, tease out through some specific examples some potential general trends. I'm going to start with... Um, a company I'm working with at the moment called G GTN. GTN stands for Generative Tensorial Networks. And they have a massive opportunity to do positive good for humankind. Um, they are working at the intersection of generative AI and tensorial methods from quantum physics to tackle the challenges of small molecule drug discovery. A drug discovery is a broken industry at the moment. Discovering a new drug costs, on average, $2.5 billion, takes 15 years, and often it's not even particularly innovative. And there are two main reasons for this. One is that the search space for finding potential small molecules is massive. Um, the number of different small molecules that would potentially be suitable for, for making drugs um, is about 10 to the power of 80. And 10 to the power of 80, um, as some of you will know, is approximately the entire number of atoms in the universe. That gives you the size of the space. 
Um, and also, um, they need to represent these molecules in a very, very rich form, including things like the entanglement properties. Um, they need to do this in order to be able to assess and predict the binding characteristics of these molecules. Will they bind to the target protein? And also, equally importantly, the toxicity um, impact, uh, i.e. making sure that they do not bind to all the other proteins in our body. Now, this is an application of AI that even the most skeptical Luddites would find difficult to dislike. Uh, they can genuinely find, find solutions to currently undruggable diseases, and they can find solutions to healthcare more quickly, more cost-effectively, and better. <coughs> they do this by helping the research scientists in the laboratories of pharmaceutical companies. So to that extent, this is AI augmenting human jobs. But it's quite indirect. I'm going to look now at a couple of more direct examples, starting with Kieran Medical. Kieran Medical are using um, advanced um, AI-based image analysis to address breast tumor diagnosis through mammography. This is um, a very high volume and complex job currently undertaken by radiologists. Typically, every mammogram in the UK is reviewed by two radiologists, one primary radiologist and then a second audit, um, trying to minimize the number of false negatives and also minimize the number of false positives, which are um, incredibly traumatic and invasive, unnecessary procedures. If Cure and Medical are to be successful in this space, their technology needs to have several characteristics. Firstly, they need to achieve human or superhuman specificity and sensitivity. In other words, they need to get their false negative rate down below 10%, and they need to get their false positive rate also down below 10%. Secondly, they need to fit naturally into the workflow. Thirdly, radiologists need to trust and welcome the technology. And fourthly, healthcare payers, and that, in this country that means clinical commissioning groups, uh, need to see an economic benefit. I believe that Kieran are actually going to achieve all of those goals sometime during 2018. And when they do that, this technology will significantly augment the work done by radi radiologists in mammography, making them considerably more efficient. Now, moving to a different area, uh, Optimal are uh, using um, deep reinforcement learning to improve greenhouse growing. This sounds like a particularly niche area, but it's actually a rapidly growing area. And just to give you a sense, um, a commercial greenhouse is often the size of several football, football pitches. These are massive, massive glass structures um, with literally tens of thousands of plants in them. They're currently managed by growers using um, a level of intuition learned over many years, which we typically refer to as green fingers. But there are not very many expert growers in the world. Most of them are in, in Holland. Um, and there is a, um, a rapid expansion of these greenhouses um, in places like China and South America. Um, the optimal technology observes what these growers do in response to many different inputs from sensors containing such things as humidity, temperature, and so on. And they use these inputs to make small adjustments to the climate in the greenhouse. They do this for two reasons. One is to conserve energy, and the other is to optimize yield. By observing these behaviors and appropriately labeling them, um, Optimal are able to create a data set and a set of algorithms that allow these growers based in Holland to remotely control greenhouses in other geographies around the world. So that's another example of pretty direct augmentation. But it's easy to see, in the optimal case, how that augmentation becomes um, job replacement. Um, it's not difficult to imagine that once the optimal technology has learned everything there is to learn and codified all the behaviors of the, of the growers that it is observing, then the growers will become redundant. And 
the optimal technology will be able to automate the greenhouse, leaving the only human jobs in the greenhouse being the more manual jobs of loading seed trays, etc. But those manual jobs are actually quite susceptible to robotic uh, replacement. And in fact, there are already greenhouses where those low-skill jobs are being done by robots. So a combination of those robots and the optimal technology will lead to an entirely automated greenhouse. Going back to the Kieran example for a second, then we can see how a similar set of steps will also lead to um, replacement of the human radiologists. The first step will be that the second radiologist who does the audit will be displaced by a technology audit done by the Kieran technology. Then over time, we'll switch to a scenario where the Kieran technology is doing the primary diagnosis, but that diagnosis will be audited by human radiologists. And when no human radiologists have identified um, erroneous false positives or false negatives produced by the Kieran technology, eventually the regulators will say that this is a diagnostic procedure that can now be entirely automated. Consequence being that those radiologists can then focus on other tasks not yet automated by Kieron or by any other software business. But over time, those other tasks like um, muscular skeletal analysis um, and other more complex cancers will also be automated, leading ultimately to a, to a surplus supply of radiologists and then wage deflation for radiologists and then uh, medical students will no longer train for radiology but they'll train for other jobs within the medical sector, which is, again, a good thing because um, in a world where we're trying to improve healthcare and where we are desperately short of doctors, um, that sort of transition um, is not going to be in any way painful. Let's look now at a, um, at a different sector. Um, I mentioned there that wage deflation um, uh, would, would come into play um, as a result of AI. Um, there is a converse where wage inflation caused by some external event can lead to more rapid adoption of AI. Um, in uh, Ontario this year, uh, they increased the minimum wage by 20%. And um, the next month, they saw the largest rise in unemployment on record. Uh, now, it's too early to prove causality here, but uh, some economists and some um, executives in the retail sector are saying that such an increase in minimum wage, which is very prevalent in the retail sector, is directly leading toward to substitution of checkout assistance by self-checkout terminals. And um, uh, the recent Amazon Go um, publicity, which is pretty spectacular, has caused um, some commentators to observe that the jobs in the retail sector in the US, of which there are about 3.5 million, are extremely vulnerable to technology substitution. Now, I don't think we need anything as glamorous as the fully automated Amazon Go experience. And you can look at supermarkets here in the UK, Waitrose, Tesco's, Sainsbury's, whoever. They're all putting in more and more self-service um, checkouts. That's partly for customer convenience, um, as, as customers become more and more comfortable with it, but every self-service checkout is one less human checkout. I'm going to move now to a slightly more complex example. Um, it's a company called Tractable, um, who are using artificial intelligence to disrupt car insurance claim estimating. Sounds like a pretty arcane business, but it is a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and essentially, the... Uh, the mission for Tractable is to take images of a damaged car after a road accident and, uh, and work out, based on learning from previous images and previous repair schedules, what the appropriate cost is for the repair to ensure that there is no fraud between the body shop and the insurance company. That's a job that's typically been done by people called loss adjusters. And um, a recent case study demonstrated that the tractable technology provided literally an order of magnitude in increase in um, efficiency and turnaround time, decrease in turnaround time for um, loss adjustment. But more importantly, the tractable technology can also tell whether the most efficient way to deal with this particular damage is repair or replacement. 
And as a result, they've been able to um, uh, make the cost of the um, damage uh, less for the insurance company by resulting in more repairs. Uh, now, when a repair happens, then that means more work for the body shop. It takes longer to do a repair than to do a replace. But it costs less overall for the insurance company, so they're pleased. And the body shop is pleased because they make more margin on a repair than a replace. And of course, it means more jobs for panel beaters. So it's too early to say whether the um, loss in loss adjustment jobs will be outweighed by the increase in panel beating jobs. But it's interesting to see how these different parts of the um, job economy move. Um, of course, if you look further down the supply chain, then ultimately, if more parts are repaired rather than replaced, then there will potentially be job losses somewhere in the spare parts industry. But there is a much larger narrow AI elephant in the room that um, will disrupt the market that uh, Tractable are addressing. That elephant in the room is level five autonomous vehicles. A lot has been written about um, the impact of level five autonomous vehicles on jobs for the one and a half million truck drivers in the United States and also um, for uh, taxi drivers around the world. But one of the other consequences of all autonomous, truly autonomous vehicles is that there will be almost no road accidents. And I think most people who are engaged with the subject believe that once we get to level five autonomy and we don't have any more human drivers on the road, we will not have many accidents. And that, of course, will um, entirely change the whole, all three players in the sector that Tractable are addressing, i.e. car insurance, um, car repair, and spare parts supply. All of those industries will be fundamentally changed by autonomous vehicles. Uh, <coughs> Benedict Evans at Andreessen Horowitz has also predicted some less obvious um, job impacts of autonomous vehicles. Most gas stations on US interstate highways have associated with them a convenience store. If there are less truckers driving trucks, then there are less people buying stuff in those convenience stores. Therefore, there will be an impact on retail jobs. But much more radically than that, I believe, without any accidents, there will be many, many less deaths on the road. Um, in the US last year, 40,000 people were killed in road accidents. And that staggeringly large number is completely dwarfed by the several million people who had non-fatal accidents but still resulted in hospitalization. Slightly macabre thought, but less people dying on the road means less jobs in A&E um, units in hospitals. Um, of course, those people who don't die in accidents on the road will ultimately die uh, in another way, and um, that might be a long time in the future, and there may also be jobs created looking after those people. Um, as they get old. Um, but there are many other jobs um, related to accidents on the roads, such as lawyers, law enforcement officers, um, local authority administrators, where those jobs may genuinely disappear. Another impact of autonomous vehicles um, is going to be on the number of um, cars that are owned by individuals. Um, if you look at the average time that a car in the UK spends sat still, parked, versus driving, only 5% of the time is active. The remaining 95% is spent parked on the road or in a garage. Once we have autonomous taxis, then they will become considerably more cost-effective. I think 70% of the cost of an Uber right now goes to the Uber driver. So... Um, the cost equation changes entirely, and also the availability of those autonomous taxis um, becomes um, much better, certainly during the night. So um, there are predictions that we will see considerably less personal car ownership, and in that case, of course, there will be less factories required to make cars, and therefore less jobs in automotive manufacturing. Let's change to a different scenario now. Um, imagine a time where um, we can order entirely personalized meals made from fresh ingredients in automated kitchens that are then delivered to our homes 
by um, autonomous delivery vehicles. Um, now, in that scenario, um, it's not that we have robots waiting table in restaurants, but it's that we will spend less time going to restaurants because the home delivery um, service will be so convenient, so personal, so cheap, and so delicious. Well, maybe, or maybe not. And maybe not because the experience of going to restaurants is a deeply social experience. And integral to that social experience is the originality of the menu and the ambiance of the restaurant. And that menu originality derives from the creativity of the chef. And the ambiance derives from the empathy of the waiting staff. And those are two characteristics that are maybe innately human, which will never be replaced by AI. Um, and when I hear people cite the various categories of behavior that are innately human, um, the four most common ones I hear are dexterity, creativity, empathy, and metacognition, or learning about learning. So let's look at each of those in a bit, bit more detail, starting with dexterity. Uh, many of you will have seen last year a video clip from Boston Dynamics showing off their latest robot, which could run, jump, and literally perform backflips. I think with that level of um, technological improvement and some of the advances that we've seen recently in self-teaching robotic arms, I'm skeptical that dexterity is uniquely human. Um, now, moving on to creativity, which we find it hard to define and even harder to acquire. Um, one of the reasons why we find it so hard to acquire is that it is usually built upon an immense amount of domain knowledge. Great painters are often already great draftsmen, and there is a reason for the 10,000 hours rule of thumb. But we are already seeing uh, technology, AI-based technology, that can, for example, produce perfectly credible musical compositions. Now, whether those compositions are genuinely creative is a matter for huge debate, and indeed, it is still a matter of debate whether they can ever be genuinely creative. But if we just look at the creativity that most of us use in our day jobs, then I think AI is already pretty potent. After all, um, creativity is based upon large amounts of domain knowledge, and AI is extremely good at ingesting appropriately labeled domain knowledge. My third area um, was metacognition. Now, first thing to say here is that things that start with meta are often quite difficult. Meta epistemology is the study of the study of knowledge. Metamorphosis is either the changing of one's physical shape or a novel by Franz Kafka. Both of those sound pretty tricky propositions to me. And in fact, actually, thinking about it, we should have spotted a red flag when we decided to rename our business to MetaSwitch Networks. But, but seriously, um, thinking about thinking and learning about learning are the skills which have allowed us to build the AI which we know today. Um, and it's no surprise that one of the great visionaries um, in AI, Demis Hassabis, is himself um, a PhD in neuroscience. Um, if you haven't seen uh, Demis's uh, video of him talking at the most recent NIPS conference, then I suggest you take a look, um, where he talks about um, the journey from AlphaGo through AlphaGo Zero to Alpha Zero. And he makes some interesting observations um, on how Alpha Zero performed. Uh, and in particular, the fact that um, Alpha Zero, which was trained from scratch to play chess without any um, human, I mean, the only input was the rules of the game, uh, trained by playing itself, uh, and then implemented um, a move, um, a strategy, a long-term sacrifice strategy, that grandmasters until then didn't even realize was a thing. So this is not mimicry. This is actually, um, in some form, learning. And perhaps the most profound thing about AlphaZero is that the developers of AlphaZero no longer understand quite why it's doing what it does. And that's not because there's too much data for them to, to absorb. 
And it's not because they don't understand the tools they're using. It's because there is something going on here which is, in some sense, learning. Now, moving on to empathy. Empathy is what we use to actually um, understand and then respond to the emotions of those with whom we are interacting. And it's critical in many jobs ranging from social care to sales agent to Brexit negotiator. And it's our capacity to do this and AI's inability to do this that makes us think these jobs are innately human. But one of the companies on the current Entrepreneur First cohort um, believe they can change that. They believe that empathy comes from observing a large amount of labeled data. We learn from the way people behave. We see their, we see their external symptoms, and then we see things go wrong when they get cross, or we see things go well when they get excited, and we change our behavior accordingly. So they are building a large corpus, of, actually, of physiological data from wearables. Um, uh, so when, we, when our emotion changes, then our heart rate variance changes and our skin conductance changes. And there are other physiological signals, as well as voice tone and, and facial expression, which they're building into their data set. And they're able to label that data set because their signal is being used by application developers where the users of those applications are willing to provide um, the label data, essentially. So they're working with mindfulness and well-being application developers where people, by their very nature, enter into the application how they're feeling at any particular point in time. So there is a natural labeling process going on. And um, M Limbic, this particular company, believe that in due course, their empathy signal will be ingested by other AI systems to allow them to behave in ways that are either empathetic or at least apparently empathetic. The other interesting thing about uh, Limbic there is this is not AI for augmenting humans. It is AI for augmenting AI. Um, and I think that is a, um, is a, is a signal um, of the way things will develop here, where we will have more and more complex systems of interrelated and interoperating narrow AI that will together produce rich solutions. And those will exist a long, long time before we get to full artificial general intelligence. Uh, now, I'm now going to act as devil's advocate for a moment. Um, when I arrived in Cambridge today with my wife, um, we were walking down Trinity Street, uh, and Cheryl, um, sorry, Cheryl, wait for the audience. So, <laughs> Cheryl, um, Cheryl recognized that I was looking a bit de dejected because uh, my mobile phone battery had gone flat just at the time when I was looking for a coffee shop. But she's very resourceful, so she stepped out and apprehended a gentleman in a gown walking down the street. Let's call him Ross. And uh, Ross, um, very uh, irascible chap, said, look, I've got far better things to do with my time than sitting in coffee shops, so I can't tell you where one is, um, and so I'm certainly not here to act as a local tourist guide. Shirl smiled at him sweetly, expressed her admiration for the Cambridge academics who spend all their time in search of knowledge rather than the daily pleasures of life. Um, at which point, Ross softens a little bit and explained that he was off to attend a lecture entitled, This House Believes That All Debate Is Conjecture and Refutation. She'll pause a little, very meta, very Cambridge. Um, but as Ross walked away, he said, you may, be able to find, um, the, you may be able to find that the Keys porters will be able to help you. Uh, so, Shirl could not unfortunately find a train station or any porters, let alone any porters with keys. But she did find a college called Gonville and Caius, um, went inside um, to a place by the door marked Porter's Lodge. There were no porters inside, but the very helpful lady behind the desk suggested that if she went down the second alleyway on the left, there's probably somewhere down there. Shirl looked at the woman's face, used her intuition, um, walked out, ignored the second turning on the left, went down the third alleyway on the right, and very soon triumphantly returned, bearing coffee held aloft, wrapped in her warm scarf. Now, this is all to say that even for the most simple of tasks, when we're in an unstructured environment, we use an immense amount of empathy, creativity, and intuition. Uh, coincidentally, actually, last, week, last weekend, I read an article about 
um, a company in San Francisco called Cafe X, who have just opened three robotic coffee shops. Um, now, this feels to me somewhat like a technology looking for a problem. We've had vending machines for the last 20 years that are perfectly good at producing coffee. So why on earth would we need a robot to mimic a barista? Uh, but actually, there seems to have been reasonably positive response from customers so far. And in fact, several customers commented that what they really liked was that once the robot had made the coffee, then it waved at them. <laughs> I find this a little bit sad, but it says something about our desire to anthropomorphize the technology with which we are interacting. <coughs> so, <coughs> whether or not technology, AI, can do the full job, I'm convinced that AI augmentation of humans, making them very much more efficient, will lead to massive disruption of the job, job market. I read a report which suggested that only 5% of jobs would be fully um, susceptible to automation. But the report didn't say anything about the remaining 95%, which is, where, which is I think, the much more significant question. If in those 95% of jobs, most people can become twice as efficient or 10 times as efficient through AI augmentation, then jobs will necessarily go. Um, I think the obvious analogy here is agricultural workers um, in the past 100 years. Um, it's not that tractors replaced farmers. It's simply that tractors made farmers so much more efficient, such that a job that previously required 10 people now only required one. Now, I hear you say, yes, but those agricultural workers are not on the dole. They're not unemployed. Society has changed. New jobs have arisen, better jobs have arisen, better paid jobs have arisen, and they are now all fully employed. And that's true. And those same job optimists then go on to say, therefore, if AI replaces um, humans, we shouldn't worry, because that will remove drudgery, and new as yet unidentified jobs will materialize, and people will be able to do those jobs. My issue with this is that it's quite fair that you cannot identify what the precise jobs are yet, but you certainly should be able to say what characteristics those jobs have. Because my question is, if AI can do all jobs that we currently know about, what will be the characteristics of these new jobs that means AI cannot do them? And no one has yet compelled me in that regard. Maybe the better analogy is the horse. Um, tractors did not lead to mass human unemployment, but they did lead to mass horse unemployment. So maybe the tractor is to the horse as AI is to the human. Probably the most interesting question here is one of timing. Um, there is um, a law called Amara, Amara's Law in which he states that we will almost always overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And that short-term overestimate is probably because we, um, we don't take enough account of um, inertia, both in terms of deployment of capital and just in terms of human behavior. And the long-term underestimate is because we are incapable of conceiving quite how radical exponential advancement can be. So the real question is where is the pivot point between underestimate and overestimate? Um, now, I'm pretty sure that my, many of the things I've talked about here will not happen in the next 10 years. Um, I'm much less confident as to whether the changes will happen in 15 years' time or 20 years' time. But I do believe, ultimately, that there will be significantly less jobs going around, meaning that there are only jobs for a smaller workforce or smaller jobs for the same workforce. It's worth, at this stage, saying something about demographics. Um, for almost all developed countries, we now have a net fertility rate lower than 2.1. 2.1 is the magic number in a developed country, which leads to um, a stable population, which is neither increasing nor decreasing. Um, and um, China is already very well on way below that 2.1 number, and even India will be there very shortly. Um, evidence also suggests that it's almost impossible, once you've gone below that number, to actually persuade the population to be more fertile. Um, they've tried all sorts of experiments in South Korea and Japan with very little impact. 
Um, and it seems that once women are properly um, integrated and fairly integrated into the education system and into the wage economy, then um, it becomes very difficult um, to incentivize um, more, time, more, more child production. So um, population is still actually growing, and it's growing for two reasons. It's growing because we're living longer, and it's growing because of an arithmetic effect called population momentum. Uh, the current predictions are that the, the world population will stabilize at around the end, end of this century. Um, but certainly, a long, long time before that, a very long time before that, we will see that, particularly in developed countries, the working age population will be much smaller relative to the retired population. And therefore, we will have a smaller workforce needing to support a larger population. And to that extent, maybe we've actually reached a situation where we actually need artificial intelligence. We need those productivity gains from AI in order to um, support our population from a smaller workforce. So at this stage, you may be asking, well, Chris, are you saying that AI is a good thing or a bad thing? And if on balance it's a bad thing, should we be doing something about slowing it down? Um, now, I think that's a very valid question because I think some of the consequences of artificial intelligence could be extremely profound. Um, if we look um, at the economy from a global perspective, there are many questions about whether or not AI will um, mean that people in low-cost economies find it easier or harder to deliver services to people in high-cost economies. Will the impact of AI decrease or increase the spread of wealth between nations? Will AI lift more people out of poverty or push more people into poverty. I'm sure there are several Nobel Prizes in economics up for grabs for people who have plausible answers to these questions. And there may well also be one or two Nobel Peace Prizes available to anyone who can sort out the ensuing carnage when the economists' predictions turn out not to be quite correct. But in any of these scenarios, it seems to me that the nations which are the homes to technology giants will be better off than the nations which are not. And I say this because much of the prosperity dividend from AI will flow as economic rent to those technology giants. Now, economic rent is excess profit that can be uh, acquired by um, uh, someone who owns an asset that is not available to other people. So classic examples of rent-seeking behavior would be... Um, an excess toll on a bridge charged by the riparian landowner when it's the only bridge for 20 miles, or um, data charges that bear no relationship to the cost of providing the data service that are charged by mobile phone companies by nature of them having uh, a monopolistic access to the, to the spectrum license. If we look at the technology giants, Facebook, Apple, Google, then they all benefit from network effects. Um, a network effect is um, uh, a scenario in which an additional service, an additional person joining the service creates value for the people who are already users of that service. So to take the Google example, the more people that search using Google, then the more accurate the search results become, and therefore the better it becomes for existing users. These network effects tend to make it possible to build very, very large user communities. And those user communities, in turn, make it possible to command high advertising revenues. And those advertising revenues effectively become the economic rents that are flowing to the technology giants. And taxing these economic rents is incredibly difficult because these technology giants are global companies, and the imperative to provide shareholder returns means that they will inevitably... Uh, think very carefully about their territorial um, incorporation, and they will also use creative transfer pricing. But taxing those economic rents may be absolutely essential in order for us to deliver universal basic income, universal job guarantees, universal basic services, or other mechanisms that we use to subsidize household incomes where people are no longer in full-time employment. 
I can foresee a world where, by making economic changes, then uh, people no longer have to work full-time, and they can spend more time doing the more traditional things like child-rearing, social care, and work within the community. Wouldn't it be great to be back in a world where those are the most valued and most valuable tasks that we do, rather than being wage slaves to corporate shareholders? The challenge is that no one yet knows quite what changes we need to make to our culture and to our taxation systems in order to bring about those changes. And in a global world, this is a compounded problem. And, sta and states um, in history have not been good at making radical changes um, before we see stark individual deprivation, civil unrest, or warfare. Back to the question of whether or not, therefore, AI is a good or a bad thing. I think it's actually a moot point. It's definitely a thing, and it's on a train. It's on a train that has definitely left a station and is proceeding irreversibly down a precipitous track. I think any nation which tries to stop that train will simply fall under the wheels. Far better, in my view, to embrace the technology, to be at the forefront of innovative deployment, to be thoughtful about the potential consequences, and to proactively mitigate any unintended ones. Now, I'm not actually um, a pessimist. I, I think that this is a great future, potentially. I do think there are some very serious bumps on the way. Um, but if we embrace those changes, um, we will be going in the right direction. And I also think that um, those uh, uniquely human skills which I talked about earlier will be around for a long time, and there will be jobs which will be very, very um, well remunerated and very valuable jobs using those skills. And interestingly, um, one such career is engineering, um, contrary to much popular um, opinion. Uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering recently produced a report entitled Thinking Like an Engineer, in which they identified engineering habits of mind. And three of those engineering habits of mind were creative problem solving, adaptive learning, and team working. In other words, they were habits of mind that are fundamentally underpinned by some of those human skills I talked about earlier, creativity, empathy, and metacognition. Now, engineering, of course, is increasingly um, based on, or is, computing. So, you'll be unsurprised to realize that I feel extremely bullish about the job prospects for most people in this room today. If you are studying at one of the best engineering colleges at one of the best universities in the world, good choice, folks. <laughs> More seriously, um, there is a massive shortage of AI talent around the world. Um, and many of the largest corporations have decided that the right place to build their engineering talent is in London or in Cambridge. So there will be a large number of extremely highly paid AI jobs in this area and in London for the next 10 or 20 years. Those small teams of AI engineers will, I'm sure, um, automate hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs, and sometimes millions of jobs. But other small teams of engineers using the power of AI will eradicate disease, will create sustainable food supplies, and may even create a more transparent, open society. So I'm going to finish with an appropriately Churchillian piece of rhetoric. Uh, I say to the young people here today, without exaggeration, that at no time before in history have technologists like you had tools available with such power to change the world, and not just to change the world, but to change the world for good. Thank you. Ross, do we have time for questions? Uh, yes, thanks, Chris. Um, questions? Silas. Yeah. Is it a cause for concern that AIs like um, AlphaZero 
can't really explain why they made the decisions that they made. I mean, at least with an algorithm, we can analyze it. And with a human, we can ask, why did you do that? But uh, alpha zero, we, we've got no idea sometimes why it's made its decision. Could, could that be a problem? Um, uh, yes, I think it can. Um, I mean, it can be a problem. And it, in fact, there are some very difficult ethical issues around that. And if AI makes a decision that the owners of that AI cannot explain, and that decision is um, detrimental, you know, ultimately in the case of an autonomous vehicle, for example, leads to human death, then who is actually liable? I think there's a lot of feeling at the moment that the people who created that AI in such a way that they couldn't explain it are ultimately liable. So I do think that we will see a lot of focus in the coming years on how to actually make it so that we can understand why it's doing what it's doing. And that would be very, very difficult. Any more? Yes, we have uh, one over here. Let me get the mic to you. Um, as we're recording this for posterity. Hi, um, my name's Robbie. Um, I didn't know, but my daughter works at EF. <laughs> I didn't know there was growing this evening. Um, it's a question really about uh, an anthropocentric fallacy in thinking that the apogee of cognition, perception, and intelligence are uniquely human qualities. And that it's quite, or it's a question, do you see it possible for other forms of embodied intelligence um, of the kind we have to emerge? And within that question is, do you not think that actually the notion of artificial general intelligence like us is like hunting the snark? Uh, um, I don't think it will necessarily be like us. Um, uh, do I think different embodiments of intelligence are possible? Yes. Um, can you, I mean, can you just uh, elucidate the question a bit? What, what, you, what are you trying to tease out? Do you think, are you, are you suggesting that there will not be anything that is generally intelligent, or if it is, it will just be very different from us? I think it'll be very different from us is what I'm trying to tease out. Yeah. I think the, the sort of the combination of things that we have through our embodied intelligence, the spectra of light, we're able to see the things we can hear, yeah. uh, the particular you know, way that our brain works. We're, I don't know whether you're a reductionist when it comes to neuroscience and the belief that we will crack the, you know, the uh, people like Hannah Critchlow believe that we will get to understanding neuronic connections. Um, how far away are we from doing that? Because we, until we do that, it seems to me to sort of a replication, which is where some people seem to be heading with this sort of moonshot project, seems to me to be well, a quest that I'm not sure is ever achievable. Uh, I, actually, I agree with you. Um, I think there will be an intelligence, and I think it will be um, ultimately extraordinarily difficult, different from us. And I think this is the scary part to me about when we get to AGI, because once we go past AGI, then very quickly, that, that intelligence will be able to think about, answer questions that we can't even, um, we can't even formulate the questions, because it will have a different set of behaviors, a different set of contexts and backgrounds, and may or may not have emotions as we understand them. I think we will, I think we will progress adding, and I think I'm, I'm reasonably of the view that we can, um, we can deduct, deduce an awful lot about how the brain works that we will sort of use that usefully. Um, but I think there's going to be some point where things may well deviate from, from the line we thought we were traveling down. Any more? One over on the other side. My name's James. Um, do you have thoughts on, if you extrapolate the situation where uh, AI you know, takes over, replaces uh, a, a lot of jobs, and then the knowledge involved in those jobs uh, becomes no longer necessary for the majority of the population, do you have thoughts on, the, on whether there's a crossover point there between, where, you know, for humans, a lot of that knowledge which would have enabled us to perform those tasks disappears and we end up in a, in a, you know, a heavily reliant society where if the machine breaks, <laughs> uh, yes. no one's able to, to, you know, to re replicate or replace that functionality. Uh, sadly, I do, yes. Um, I mean, you only need to look at the sort of very, very banal problem of source code for IBM mainframes, for example, where, where no one can, can currently change that source code because like, they just, nobody remembers why it was written the way it is. And those aren't particularly complex systems. You know, you've got a million lines of source code or whatever. It's, you know, it's all rules-based. 
but yet those systems are, are untouchable. So I think that's absolutely going to be something that we will get to. I mean, there's many, many simple examples you can already look at. Uh, people's ability to read maps. And, you know, there's evidence that we're getting much less good at reading maps now we have GPS. People's ability to do arithmetic because we have calculators. So as we can do more and more things with AI, I think some of those things which today people find relatively straightforward in the future, they'll, if you took the AI away, they wouldn't know where to start. Um, any more? In that case, oh, there's, there's one over here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned earlier an analogy that AI might be to the human as the tractor was to the horse. And I think it's one that I've heard before. And I've also heard the response, uh, the difference, the key difference, of course, is that we live in a democracy and humans can vote and ultimately control the laws and you know, processes by which society is run. So do you think that's enough to protect us from going the same way? And, and do you think it brings any additional risks of its own? Oh, I mean, I should say that I think the tractor analogy is, in, is in, in, the horse analogy is incredibly simplistic, um, and um, it, uh, so uh, I think there are many reasons why that analogy doesn't stand up, and that one that you put forward there is one argument. I'm not so convinced that we can actually use those democratic processes to stop things from happening. Um, I think in a global economy. Um, if we try and, in the UK, try and stop stuff, then um, I, I don't necessarily see that everybody else is going to do the same. And, you know, and there is an argument that says, look, better off if this technology is at least understood by and in the hands of the good guys, because sure as hell it's, all, it's going to be in the hands of the bad guys anyway. So we'd best do our best to put it in the hands of the good guys. Um, and I do think in a global economy there is going to be an AI arms race, um, and um, I do believe that you're better off being um, at the front of it, forearmed and forewarned, rather than trying to shy away from it. And that means, I think, ultimately, that any, any decisions around, we need to stop this from happening, guys, because it's impacting on our human freedoms, is something that can only be done um, at, at a global forum, and we know how long those sorts of global fora take to actually make any movements and, and therefore I think now is the time for those sorts of decisions to be being handled um, in, in global consultations. Great. Well, if there are no further questions, then let's thank Chris again for an extremely stimulating and thought-provoking lecture.